Welcome to the Daily Current Affairs by Civic Center IAS, where we try to discuss the important articles from the Hindu, the Indian Express and the PIB from the UPSC CSC prelims perspective. Displayed are the list of articles which we are going to discuss in today's video. The first article of the day says that the Public Accounts Committee, headed by the Congress leader and Lok Sabha MP KC Venugopal, will hold a performance review of regulatory bodies established by the Act of Parliament such as the SEBI. In this context, let us talk about the Public Accounts Committee. See, the Public Accounts Committee is one of the three financial parliamentary committees and the other two are the Estimates Committee and the Committee on Public Undertakings. If we have to talk about how it was established, see, the Public Accounts Committee was first introduced in the year 1921 after its mention in the Government of India Act of 1919. Also known as the Montek Shells Form Reforms. But the Public Accounts Committee is now constituted every year under Rule 308 of the Rules of Procedure and Conduct of Business in Lok Sabha. Further, it is to be noted that the committee, not being an executive body, can only make decisions that are advised, advisory by nature. Further, the Public Accounts Committee aids the Parliament in financial scrutiny of the government. Know that it comprises of not more than 22 members. 15 members are elected by the Lok Sabha Speaker and 7 members are elected by the Rajya Sabha Chairman with a term of only one year. Moving on to talk about the appointment. See, the Chairman of the Committee is appointed by the Speaker of the Lok Sabha. Then, conventionally, starting from the Public Accounts Committee of 1967-68, a member of the Committee belonging to the main opposition party or the group in the house is appointed as the chairman of the committee. Remember that a minister is not eligible to be elected as a member of the committee and if a member after the election to the committee is appointed as a minister, then he or she ceases to be a member of the committee from the date of such appointment. Now, what are the roles and functions of the committee? See, firstly, to check on the government, especially with respect to its expenditure bill. Secondly, it examines the audit report of the CAG after it is laid in the parliament. Further, the committee promotes the basic principle that the parliament embodies the will of the people by exercising check over the executive. Next, it keeps a check on the money spent on any service during a financial year. Lastly, it examines the accounts of state corporations, trading concerns, and manufacturing projects. Now, moving on to the second article, it says that the Assam government has decided to implement most of the recommendations of a panel appointed by the Ministry of Home Affairs to apply Clause 6 of the Assam Accord by April 15th of 2024. In this context, let us talk about Assam Accord and also we'll see what Clause 6 is. See, the Assam Accord was signed in August 1985 to mark the end of a violent six-year agitation to eject illegal foreigners from the state. Know that it was a tripartite accord signed between the government of India, the state government of Assam and the leaders of the Assam movement in the year 1985. Significantly, the Ministry of Home Affairs was the nodal ministry for the implementation of the accord. Then, in the year 1986, a new department was set up under the government of Assam called the Implementation of Assam Accord Department to implement the various clauses of the Memorandum of Settlement. Now, if we have to look at the main provisions of the Assam Accord, firstly, detection, deletion and deportation of illegal migrants who entered Assam after 25th March of 1971. Secondly, safeguarding the political, social and cultural rights of the Assamese people. Thirdly, providing constitutional, legislative and administrative safeguards to protect and preserve the culture, social and linguistic identity and heritage of the Assamese people. And lastly, accelerating the economic development of Assam. Now, if we have to talk specifically about Clause 6 of the Accord, it says that uh, constitutional, legislative and administrative safeguards, as may be appropriate, uh, shall be provided to protect, preserve and promote the cultural, social linguistic identity and heritage of the Assamese people. Now, moving on to the third article of the day, it says that the Parliament's Joint Committee examining the WAC Amendment Bill has so far received 8 lakh petitions from the institutions and the public, according to the sources. In this context, 
let us talk about relevant aspects so what is a vak see a vak is a property given in the name of god for religious and charitable purposes in legal terms it is the permanent dedication by a person professing islam of any movable or immovable property for any purpose recognized by the muslim law as pious religious or charitable now moving on to talk about the vak amendment bill let us look at the key changes firstly with respect to the title and scope it renames the vak act of 1995 and proposes amendments to enhance the management of the vak properties secondly with respect to the definitions it clarifies the definition of vak as a property endowed by a muslim with at least 5 years of practice further it introduces new definitions including aga khani vak bohra vak and the government property then with respect to the governance it transfers the powers from the vak boards or tribunals to the state governments next it allows the non muslim ceos and members on state vak boards then it permits the central government to audit vaks through appointment auditors furthermore with respect to the registration and survey it requires vak creation through a vak deed then it transfers the survey functions to the collector further it mandates public notice sir, before the land records are mutated as vak property then with respect to the composition of the boards it broadens the composition of the central vak council and state vak boards ensuring representation of muslim women non muslims and various muslim communities lastly the bill removes the provision that allowed properties to be deemed vak through continuous use by muslims making valid vak deeds mandatory for the property recognition the next article says that tamil nadu had initially agreed to the centers prime minister schools for rising india in short called the pm shri scheme but eventually they refused to sign the memorandum of understanding and remained ambiguous over the issue according to the tamil nadu governor r n ravi c the pm shri scheme approved by the cabinet on september 7th of 2022 is a centrally sponsored initiative aimed at establishing over 14500 pm shri schools know that these schools will be selected from the existing schools managed by the central government state or ut governments local bodies kendriya vidyalaya sangathan and navodaya vidyalaya samiti now moving on to talk about the key objectives and features firstly pm shri schools will serve as a exemplar institutions showcasing the implementation of the national education policy 2020 and providing leadership to other schools in their regions secondly these schools aim to create an inclusive equitable and joyful environment that addresses diverse backgrounds multilingual needs and varying academic abilities hence the focus is on making students active participants in their learning process thirdly the schools will prioritize not just cognitive development but also the creation of well rounded individuals equipped with 21st century skills so the pedagogy will be experiential holistic integrated and inquiry driven with a focus on learner centered and discussion based learning further the scheme ensures that all students have access to good physical infrastructure and appropriate resources fostering a secure and enriching learning atmosphere additionally the assessments will focus on conceptual understanding application of knowledge to real life situations and competency rather than rote learning if we have to talk about the scheme duration and cost see the scheme will run from 2022 23 to 2026 27 after which the states or the uts will be responsible for maintaining the benchmarks achieved notably the total cost is 27360 crore rupees with a central share of 18128 crores more than 20 lakh students are expected to benefit directly the next article says that according to a study published in the journal nature access to toilets and better sanitation services under the government's uh, swachh bharat mission may have averted around 60000 to 70000 infant deaths uh, annually between the years 2014 and 2020 in this context let us talk about swachh bharat mission see the swachh bharat mission is one of the largest national behavioral change sanitation programs in the world aimed at eliminating open defecation by providing household toilets uh, across the country significantly this unique program has now metamorphosed into ensuring sampurna swachhta in the country also known as the clean india mission 
It is a significant campaign initiated by the government of India on October 2nd of 2014. Know that it is primarily aimed at eliminating open defecation, improving solid waste management and promoting cleanliness across the country. Now what are the objectives of the mission? See firstly to eliminate open defecation, secondly to eradicate manual scavenging, thirdly solid waste management, then behavioral change and lastly to raise awareness. Know that there are two submissions of the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. Firstly, Swachh Bharat Mission Urban. See, it primarily aims to address the sanitation and waste management challenges in India's rapidly expanding urban areas. Know that it was launched on October 2nd of 2014, focusing on eliminating open defecation through construction of household, community and public toilets. Notably, it also prioritizes establishing modern solid waste management systems tailored to urban contexts. Further, the key components uh, include door-to-door -door waste collection, segregation at source, and both uh, composting and recycling facilities. Then the next sub-scheme is the Swachh Bharat Mission Rural. See, this mission, also referred as SBM Rural, focuses on improving sanitation and hygiene in India's rural areas. Know that it was launched uh, alongside its urban counterpart on October 2nd, 2014. Significantly, SBM Rural aims to end open defecation across all villages by constructing individual household latrines. Further, it also provides financial incentives to encourage their use. It emphasizes community-led initiatives involving village-led workers and gram panchayats to ensure effective implementation and sustainability. Notably, key initiatives include promoting behavioral change through information, education and communication campaigns that highlight the importance of sanitation. The next article says that the Jammu and Kashmir's People Conference has pledged to fight for the restoration of Article 370, Article 35A and statehood according to the manifesto released by the party chief Sajat Loni. In this context, let us talk about them. Firstly, talking about Article 370, see it was drafted by N. Gopal Swami Iyengar who is a member of the Constituent Assembly of India and was added to the constitution as a temporary provision in the year 1949. Know that it was based on the terms of the instrument of accession, which was signed by the ruler of Jammu and Kashmir, Hari Singh, in 1947 to join India after an invasion by Pakistan. Notably, Article 370 is the first article of Part 21 of the Constitution, which is about temporary, transitional and special provisions. See, it restricts the Parliament legislative powers in respect of Jammu and Kashmir and for extending a central law on the subjects sir, included in the instrument of accession, which is a mere consultation with the state government is needed. So, the Article 370 was a provision in the Constitution of India that granted a special autonomous status to the region of Jammu and Kashmir. Significantly, Article 370 granted the state of Jammu and Kashmir significant autonomy, allowing it to have its own constitution, flag and autonomy over internal affairs except for matters such as defence, foreign affairs, finance and communications which were under the jurisdiction of Indian government. Further, this article also restricted the application of Indian laws in the state. But on August 5th of 2019, the government of India announced the abrogation of Article 370 through a presidential order. Know that this move was accompanied by reorganization of the state into two separate Indian territories, which are Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. Then moving on to talk about Article 35A, See, the Article 35A of the Indian Constitution was a provision that empowered the Jammu and Kashmir state legislature to define permanent residents of the state and provide them special rights and privileges. So, it was introduced in 1954 through a presidential order, not directly enshrined in the Constitution itself. So, the Article 35A is entailed with the following. See, the Jammu and Kashmir legislature could define who is qualified as a permanent resident and grant them exclusive rights, sir, including ownership of immoral property within the state, settlement within the state, government jobs, and scholarships and other state benefits. Further, people who weren't classified as permanent residents had limited rights in the JNK compared to the Indian citizens elsewhere. Notably, in the year 2019, the Indian government revoked Article 35A along with Article 370, which granted special autonomous status to Jammu and Kashmir. The last article of the day says that India and Singapore on Thursday elevated their bilateral ties to a comprehensive strategic partnership and signed 
for MOUs, sir, including on cooperation in semiconductors. As the, our Prime Minister, Sri Modi, held talks uh, with uh, his newly elected Singapore counterpart, Lawrence Wong Given, the critical importance of semiconductor chips uh, in virtually everything from missiles to mobile phones and from cars to computers. The pact with Singapore has greater geostrategic and geoeconomic importance. In this context, let us talk about the relevant aspects. Firstly, let us talk about India's semiconductor mission. CET is a specialized and independent business division within the Digital India Corporation. Significantly, it aims to build a vibrant semiconductor and display ecosystem to enable India's emergence as a global hub for electronics manufacturing and design. Envisioned to be led by global experts in the semiconductor and display industry, ISM will serve as the nodal agency for efficient, coherent and smooth implementation of the schemes. Now, what are the objectives of the ISM? See, firstly, to formulate a comprehensive long-term strategy for developing sustainable semiconductor and display manufacturing facilities. Secondly, to facilitate the adoption of secure microelectronics and develop a trusted uh, semiconductor supply chain. Thirdly, to enable the growth of Indian semiconductor design industry through support mechanisms for startups. Then, to promote indigenous intellectual property generation and facilitate transfer of technologies. Further, to establish mechanisms to harness economies of scale and enable cutting-edge research in semiconductors. And lastly, to foster collaborations and partnership programs with national and international agencies, industries and institutions. Now, moving on to talk about Semicon India program. See, it aims to provide attractive incentive support to companies or consortia that are engaged in silicon semiconductor fabs, display fabs, Counter semiconduct compound semiconductors, silicon photonics, sensor fabs, semiconductor packaging, and semiconductor design. Further, the program will give an impetus to semiconductor and display manufacturing by facilitating capital support and technological collaborations. If we have to talk about Singapore, it is it has a well-developed semiconductor industry. Know that it is the outcome of an early start and the vision of its Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. Significantly today, Singapore contributes around 10% of global semiconductor output along with 5% of global water fabrication capacity. Further, 9 of the world's top 15 semiconductor firms have been set up shop in Singapore and the semiconductor sector contributes significantly in the country's economic growth. Know that Singapore has players in all the segments of the semiconductor value chain like the integrated circuit design, assembly, packaging and testing, wafer fabrication and equipment or raw material production. So in this video, we have talked about uh, seven articles in total for today from the Hindu, the Indian Express and the PIB from the UPSC CSA prelims perspective. We'll be back again with another video tomorrow. Thank you.